Good morning and welcome to part two of this public service focus morning. My name is Nick Davies and I'm a programme director here at the Institute. After hearing Karen Smith's thoughts earlier on health and care, we are now going to broaden out to look at public services as a whole and in particular how to end the decline. To discuss this, I'm delighted to be joined by Kwasi Kwarteng, uh, former Chancellor of the Exchequer, George Gould, uh, leader of Camden Council, and stepping in very, very last minute, uh, Adam Bolton, uh, presenter at Times Radio. We're going to start with a short presentation from Stuart Hodnot, senior researcher at IFG, who will set out some of the key findings from Performance Tracker, our annual stock take of nine key public services. I will then ask some questions of the panellists before leaving plenty of time for questions from the audience, both in person and online. And if you are watching online, then you can already start submitting questions using Slido. Uh, we will also be uh, tweeting using the hashtag IFGGov24 and live tweeting from the at IFG events account. Right, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Stuart. Good morning. Thanks, Nick. Before we start the event today, I'm going to talk through the findings from our annual performance tracker. That will give an overview of public service performance, the drivers of performance issues, some of the implications of spending plans, and finally, our recommendations for um, government going forward. Please bear with me. This is summarising a 300-page report into about three or four minutes, hopefully, so it will necessarily be quite a whistle-stop tour. So first of all, on performance issues. The pandemic has undoubtedly hurt public service performance, with no service performing better now than on the eve of the pandemic. The performance had deteriorated in every service except for schools throughout the 2010s. That left many services much less resilient when the pandemic hit in 2020 than they would have been a decade earlier. And no service is now performing better than it was on the eve of the pandemic. All of this is the result of decisions taken over the course of many decades and administrations, particularly in relation to workforce and capital. So moving on to some of the cross-cutting drivers of these performance issues. First, strikes have undoubtedly hampered performance. Public sector pay freezes and below inflation pay rises in the 2010s fueled dissatisfaction with pay. That was combined with a, a very devastating shock of inflation in the last couple of years, and also dissatisfaction with deteriorating working conditions in many public services. That has led to some of the most impactful industrial action in the public sector in recent decades. But staffing issues are wider than just strikes. The effectiveness of public services has been further weakened by the loss of experienced staff. Those staff tend to be more productive and often more effective than their more inexperienced colleagues. But they've increasingly left the service to be replaced by inexperienced recruits. For example, in the prison service, as shown in this chart, we have never had a low proportion of prison staff with less than 10 years experience, with more than 10 years experience, apologies. And likewise, in the NHS, nurses with less than five years of experience are the fastest growing staff group on the NMC register. Services are also undermanaged with insufficient staff to carry out vital strategy and design and admin support for frontline staff, leaving doctors, nurses, police officers carrying out uh, work that could otherwise be done by some um, other colleagues. On capital, the UK has long invested less in its public services than other, other wealthy nations. Taking health as an example, there were only two years since 1970 in which the UK exceeded the OECD average for capital investment in health. The result is that today the NHS has half as many CT scanners per head of population as the OECD average, <coughs> IT systems that are not up to scratch, and the highest estates maintenance back, uh, backlog on record. All of that makes it much more difficult for staff to work productively in public services. But even by those low standards, the 2010s were particularly bad. No service had higher capital spending than in 2007-2008 between 2010-11 and 2018-19. And the Ministry for Justice was the most badly affected of all services, with capital spending averaging 50% of the 2007-2008 level throughout that decade. The result of that is now felt in those services, with a crumbling court 
uh, estate and prison capacity that is not able to deal with the rising prison population. Now on the spending plans. When the government first announced its spending plans at the 2021 spending review, they looked relatively generous. But successive years of higher than expected inflation and above expected pay deals have eroded those settlements. And the government chose at last year's autumn statement not to top up public services budgets that were struggling to deal with that inflation. The result is that many services will be struggling to return to pre-pandemic performance levels by the end of this spending review period. The situation after the end of this current spending review period is worse still. The government spending plans from, Labour, uh, from April 2025 onwards, to which Labour has also committed, are incredibly tight, with just 1% per year annual real terms increases. But when taking into account the government's commitments on foreign aid, defence and the NHS long-term workforce plan, there are worse settlements for the unprotected services, services which include schools, local government and the criminal justice sector. They will see spending settlements that average minus 1.4% per year in real terms for the next spending review period. The criminal justice sector will be particularly badly hit when taking into account forecast demand for those services, with demand far outstripping current spending plans and leaving those services much worse by the end of the next spending review period than currently. And finally, on to our recommendations. We would like to see a new multi-year budget for each public service that allows for clarity of funding and, and ease of planning across a, a, a multi-year horizon. Also, a longer-term capital programme that extends beyond the current spending review period and allows for better planning and allocation of capital resources. A stable long-term policy agenda. Too often, uh, policy has changed too frequently in public services, making it hard for staff to plan and deal with unexpected changes. And finally, an improved approach to setting pay, workforce planning, and enhanced working conditions. We welcomed the government's NHS long-term workforce plans, but most public services are, st are still trying to operate with insufficient planning uh, and oversight of their workforces. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stuart. <laughs> Thank you, Stuart. Um, Kwasi, I'd like to come to you first. Um, as set out in Stuart's presentation, spending plans from April 2025 onwards are extremely tight, uh, particularly for unprotected uh, areas of spending, where it's 1.4% real-term cuts per year. Yeah. Do you think that the next government, whoever that mm. might be, will be able to stick to those spending plans? So it was very striking to me uh, in that presentation that the one word I don't think was mentioned once uh, or f concept was economic growth. And this is at the heart of the problem because you're quite right, you know, the, the paper suggested very ably that costs are going up. Um, inflation, which is essentially exogenous, uh, a global phenomenon, um, and also pay settlements in order to motivate the workforce. And also people have to deal with inflation in their, in their, in their, in their lives. And I think if you're in a world where your tax revenues aren't going up because the economy isn't growing sufficiently fast, that's where the, the, the problem is. And you're going to, there are only really three ways of dealing with that. Either you borrow more, um, which is essentially delayed taxation. You try and increase tax rates, which essentially, in my view, just squeezes uh, uh, people more and dis disincentivizes um, economic activity. Or you've got to try and grow the economy. And I think that's where Labour, if they get in, and certainly the Tories, if we get re-elected, uh, will, be, will be focusing most of our thoughts. Because all of this um, becomes incredibly difficult, much more difficult, if you're growing at 0.2% a year, or whatever it is, or 0.5%, because your costs are going up at 4 or 5% last time I, I saw. And so you're in this, uh, what, what has been called a doom loop. And unless you actually solve the growth conundrum, you're not going to solve any of these problems. You're, going to, you're essentially uh, going to be facing the same problem, uh, and it'll get worse over time. Economic growth is clearly kind of the, the long-term answer, and we have uh, other bits of work that, that look at that. But saying there's a kind of autumn election, um, mm. spending review or spending settlements are going to be need, need to be made for the following April onwards, it's not going to be possible to deliver that growth 
quickly, or not certainly not a substantial. Uptick. Not not in eight months, no. So what's the what's the short term? What's the plan for that kind of three year spending review? So I think that they're that they're going to have to stick to the plan that's already been outlined, because actually anything else, and I've got personal experience of this, will, will, will not be will not be credible. And so far as you know, if, if the government says we're going to borrow to, to, to spend the money, I think that's 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 challenging. Um, you know what we tried to do whenever it was October 22 was 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 also um, you know rejected essentially, but the but the problem remains the same, um, and unless you actually tackle the growth conundrum, we'll be having exactly this sort of conversation in five ten years time. Um, Adam, I wanted to come to you next. So. I heard just there, of course, things we would need to, the next government would need to stick to those spending plans. Karen's speech earlier was focused on making kind of best use of existing funding, not providing more. To what extent do you think meaningful improvements are possible in public services without increased spending? And if not, is, it, is that politically sustainable given the current state of public services? Well, I'm already struck with what we've heard so far that there's sort of Going back to what Hannah was saying at the beginning, there's a big divorce on um, talking about economic reality, as indeed you did, uh, we did just heard in the presentation, and what the politicians are saying. Um, all I can say is, you know, I'm here as an interloper, I'm standing in for Stephen Bush, I don't have his wisdom, and um, as far as public service broadcasting that is concerned, I've never worked really for a public service broadcaster, but although that's a different uh, definition of what it is. I think the issue is that I appreciate what Kwasi is saying about going for growth. The problem is that you won't get growth unless you've got efficient public services. And that probably does require intervention. And, you know, day in, day out, uh, every time we do a radio program on almost every aspect of uh, our society, we come up against there is no money, there could be more investment, we could do that. And clearly, at the moment, there is not more money. I would say that what we do need is clearer and tougher regulation and clearer and tougher holding to account of public yeah. services. And I would include in public services all those things which have been privatised over the uh, previous decades. I mean, I think we are have a particular crisis in this country. If you look at water industry, the electric industry, uh, the post office anywhere, that there's been a drive towards privatisation, that there were initial productivity and efficiency benefits, mm -hmm. but that we pretty much hit the buffers on those, and they're now underinvested and are... Uh, people are taking capital out rather than putting capital in and we haven't got those benefits. So I think we need to look at our, our office, our office, you know, Ofcom, Ofwat, all the rest of them, and actually give them statutory powers which they are prepared to use. Uh, and that is one way in which I think we can improve public services. The other aspect which we, we heard this morning in the Labour presentation is yes, I think stepping back and rearranging things. I mean, you know, this discussion, for example, going on about should you stop postal deliveries on Saturday morning, where the knee jerk reaction of the Prime Minister is to say, no, 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 I won't stand for this. Mm -hmm. Yet talking to uh, people yesterday uh, in, 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 in broadcasting, I mean, a lot of younger people were saying, well, you know, I haven't sent a letter in my life and, <laughs> and, we, and, we, well, and we don't necessarily need it. And that comes down to using your NHS app. So I think there are efficiencies and efficiency savings which we need. But fundamentally, I do think there needs to be more honesty, and I don't expect we're going to get it, from politicians as we approach an election about the absence of money. And if you don't put money in, you're unlikely to be able to get anything out at the end. And I find it very frustrating that all politicians tend to duck that. Georgia, I'm going to come to you uh, next. If Labour do win the election, what will you and other local government be leaders be asking <coughs> for from Rachel Reeves in her first um, budget and spending review? I think that local government is in a really perilous 
state at the moment. We've got one in five councils saying in the next two years they might be having to declare bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And if, if, the, if local government collapses, that has a, a, a terrible knock-on impact, not just on public services, but on economic growth. I think there's a lot to welcome in what Labour have set out. I think the missions approach is an opportunity for the centre and local government to work together in a partnership of equals that we just haven't seen previously. And the devolution agenda for me is really exciting because we are one of the most centralised countries in Europe. And I think that drives much of the regional inequality and inequality within regions. And we've seen that uh, local government can deliver much more cost effectively, take test and trace during the pandemic. A huge amount was invested into a centralised system, which ultimately failed. And when all of the money had run out, uh, the government came to local government and said, you know, could you do this uh, with very little investment? And we used the relationships we had with our community to actually deliver it much more effectively. And so I think there's huge opportunities in devolution. But I think there are some, some things that we need that are relatively modest. The first is um, long-term uh, stable settlements, because at the moment it's almost impossible to, to plan. Uh, an end to competitive bidding pots. There's, I think, 100 uh, pots now on uh, for regen um, and economic growth, and there's massive waste in that. We calculated in, in London that it costs up to £140,000 to put in a bid for one of these things. Uh, I think the levelling up bid, 25 boroughs uh, put in bids, six were successful. So the waste in that is enormous. So if we just had place-based, long-term investment, we could start to plan and to leverage in private sector investment in kind of big infrastructure projects that would, that would release um, some funding from the public purse. I think we want to see investment in prevention, uh, I think that's one of the, the 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 things that has over the over austerity sadly um, been pulled away, and we're starting to see more and more uh, people reach crisis points. So I think there's some some real invest to save propositions where we can demonstrate in local government where we have made that investment in prevention, the the change that that happens. Um, I think there's something about how public services work <coughs> together. You know, often an individual is dealing with you know, multiple people in their lives, sometimes, you know, up to 20 different kind of public sector uh, workers could be involved in, in, in somebody's life. So a real duty to cooperate, uh, to bring public services together, I think would produce savings. And, uh, you know, I'd like to see us um, looking at ways that, that local government can uh, uh, capture more value itself. Um, you know, some, some, I think, not relatively modest proposals like an overnight uh, stay levy or land value capture to invest in infrastructure could make a, a, a massive difference. So I think there's some steps that we could take uh, relatively quickly that would change things that aren't going to require huge investment. That said, we do need to see, to see more investment in our public services because they are, uh, I think, a, a breaking point. I just want to pick up some of your comments on uh, both kind of greater devolution, but also longer term funding settlements, and then also link with um, Adam's point on greater accountability. So do you think that with that greater devolution, those longer term settlements, there would need to be strengthened accountability for local government? And I just thinking about, you know, the audit commission, there were lots of people in local government who were pretty happy that that was scrapped. The, the new office uh, for local government that the government set up doesn't have that many fans in local government. W what do you think a good accountability mechanism would look like if greater powers are devolved? I mean, I think local government is probably the part of government that is held most accountable. We've got um, uh, Ofsted uh, for children's services. We've got inspections for adult services, the new social housing regulator. Um, there's a huge amount of accountability that already happens. Uh, but that said, I think, you know, there is always space for for um, to, to kind of work together to look more strongly at outcomes. And I think the missions approach allows us to, to be really clear about the outcomes that we want to achieve and to um, work, you know, if, if those aren't being achieved, then um, uh, to kind of step in and, uh, and work with local government to improve things. I think there's not a huge amount of accountability the other way, though, and if you work closely with the Home Office and, say, the uh, Department for Work and Pensions, you can see that that's needed in terms of uh, a kind of duty to devolve, but also even basic things like the sharing of data and performance. So I would like to see Offlog become genuinely independent, which it isn't at the moment, and to, to, to look both ways and, and be an office for learning and improvement <laughs> for local government, uh, but also for, for central government. I'm always struck by how MPs are... Uh, 
happier to put much greater strictures on councils and councillors than they are on themselves. I don't think that's entirely fair. Um, well, even on corruption it is. But, you know, I mean, I think with regard to local, I mean, it's an interesting issue about devolution, but the problem that the centre would say, would, would, would come up with is, yes, it's all right to have devolution, and I think it's a, it might be a good idea for local councillors local councils to raise more money themselves. But then you, you mentioned the fact that one in five are under financial stress. And I have no doubt that if they were given more independence, we would have to accept an idea where more of them would be in financial difficulty. I mean, that's what usually happens when you get, give people more responsibility for raising and, and, and spending money. So I think that the, I would say that the, the level of financial stress we're seeing in the sector says more about failures of central government investment than it does about poor performance of councils. And I think you have to look at the patterns that are happening. And councils just do not have enough money to, to cover basic but, demand and services. But, so either we, look, we, we increase that investment from the centre or we allow places to generate more funding themselves um, uh, for, for long-term resilience and sustainability. But, but you've, you've got to factor in some council failure. I mean, that does exist. We can't Of pretend. course, of course, yeah. We, we can't I'm not, pretend. And I'm saying that, that there needs to be that, um, you know, off log and that needs to exist. And if sure. the council's, you know... But, you but all I'm saying is, is making a, a, a kind of almost a logical, you know, step, saying that the more freedom you give people, the more freedom they have to fail. Well, but the, I mean, the reduction, uh, the reduction in the money going from the centre to councils is far above trend of cuts in other areas. And I would have thought from your argument and your political argument, if you went to more towards a system of local taxation where, yeah. where, where, where more money was raised would you directly. Yeah, so, so I've always been in favour of that. But I'm, I'm just saying that if you're going to have that on one side, you will see probably more financial situations where the centre will have to bail out or you might, their performing you, you might councils. See, you might see higher local taxation. And, and, and you might see that. So that's, that, you know, Which you know, might that, be part of the reality of explaining to people uh, you know, where the money comes from no, for the services which yeah, they Yeah, from expect. a personal point of view, I think devolution is a good idea. And we've seen a lot of devolution in the last 20 years at, at, on the nation's level and also at the local level with mayoralties. But I think that there is, I'm just describing a situation where there is nervousness at the centre, the Treasury, other bits of Whitehall, about allowing local governments to have more, uh, more fundraising, tax raising powers, because there is a risk to that. I'm just pointing that out. Cool. I'd like to move on just to prevention. Um, so you talked a bit about um, invest to save. And I think one of the things with prevention is it does mean spending money now for benefits later, sometimes um, many decades in the future. So, Quasi, I wanted to ask you about how that works, given the sort of pervasive short-termism yeah. that there is, particularly in Westminster. It's very difficult. I mean, particularly when I was in Treasury, but also when I was in Bayes, and I was in Treasury as a very junior, um, you know, sort of bad carrier to the Chancellor, Philip Hammond at the time. I think there was, a, there was, there's a real, almost, it's a historic thing about year-end spending. So that the Treasury wants to, wants to essentially have set year budgets, because it gives it more flexibility, and frankly, a little bit more power. If you say, right, you can have this much money for three years, it's very difficult for you at the centre to kind of micromanage, as it were, the three-year settlement. So there's a reluctance to that. And, and also Parliament itself wants to be able to have annual budgets and, and, and set things annually. That's all historic. And I think you're quite right to say that in the modern world, you probably do need a bit more, uh, a, 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 lo a longer time period. The other thing that we've got to remember, and I think you know, this is a, particularly about the, the, the specific historical period, as it were, that we're living in now, I mean, post-Brexit and for lots of other reasons, we've had a huge amount of churn in government, okay? I mean, I was in lots of different roles over quite a short period. Um, and also the civil service itself is churning, and we haven't talked about that. But I think that makes m the management of public services and the provision of good public services even more challenging. You know, I mean, the classic example is, I can't remember how many housing ministers we've had. I think it's about 16. And yes, they sit underneath the Secretary of State. But it's, it's very difficult to maintain a, a consistent line if, if you've got you know, that, that sort of ministerial churn. And it's not just the ministers. It's also the DGs, the directors, the people in the system are moving around, maybe not as fast, but quickly. And I think that's a really important thing to remember when you're talking about 
you know, public service delivery. I think, I think, I think it does make it more challenging if you're having a, a, a much more uh, fluid, much more constant uh, churn of, of, of personnel. We very much agree, and it's, it's notable that the one public service that probably uh, did improve between um, 2010 and the eve of the pandemic was schools, where we had a pretty consistent uh, minister for schools across that whole time, and it continued a longer-term policy agenda <coughs> stretching back a few decades. Um, I'm going to open it up to some questions from the audience. Um, so if you have a question for our panellists, please do raise your hand or submit them online. Um, can you please give your name and organisation when doing so? Um, if you're in the room, can you please wait for the microphone to come to you? Please, can you keep your questions short? And please, 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 can you ensure they are in fact questions and not <laughs> statements? Um, I'm going to come first here and I'm going to take two or three at a time. Penelope Gibbs from Transform Justice. We noticed that um, prisons and courts have got a fall in funding. Those services are centralised in government from Whitehall, one of the most centralised areas in Whitehall. Would the money go further if uh, courts, probation and so on were actually localised and maybe prisons? Thank you very much. Uh, gentlemen at the back and then two rows in front. Thank you. Sean Williams, I'm the Chief Executive at Autogen AI. I'm uh, usually quite sceptical of magic bullet productivity and efficiency solutions, but with some of the new generative artificial intelligence we're seeing, there's a real possibility that tech can support here, and we've not heard much from the panel on that. It'd be great to get your thoughts. Thank you. And a couple of rows in front. I'm Graham Pendlebury, formerly a senior civil servant at the Department for Transport. Everybody's always in favour of long-term spending plans. Um, when Labour came to power, John Prescott introduced a 10-year transport plan, which I seem to recall lasted about two years. Um, uh, uh, and so whilst we're all in favour of them, how do you ensure that they're kind of locked in and that any long-term plan that you introduce isn't then subsequently amended or abandoned within a couple of years or so? Okay, so um, three really good questions there. One on should we be localising justice services, a uh, second on the role of AI, and the third on ensuring kind of long-term stability of policy. Um, Quasi, I'll come to you first. No, really interesting question. In a funny way, the first two questions are, so are somewhat linked because I think the model that we've grown up with is a very much a kind of probably pre-war, but certainly not much uh, after the war, centralised model. And obviously things like AI massively uh, can, can drive huge uh, productivity in that. And I think AI essentially um, is, a, is a kind of almost a metaphor for decentralization. I mean, I can't think of anything more decentralized than, than uh, some features of AI. And I think we've got to try and understand and look at ways in which we can deliver things locally. Because I view, you know, with AI into um, the development of uh, even the internet itself, um, I think there's a much greater scope for devolution, as uh, Georgia was suggesting, and for local decision making than, uh, than, than our, our model currently suggests. So I'm, I'm all for that. I think the ways, in, I, I just tried to point out earlier that there are risks in that. You're going to have much more local variation if you have uh, local uh, decision making. I mean, that seems like a logical uh, uh, inference uh, to me. Um, you're, you're, the danger is you're going to have more var variability. Uh, if you uh, decentralise power, but I think that's uh, uh, something we should we should do more of. In terms of long-term planning, I mean, I sort of rather um, frivolously and jokingly suggested two years is quite a long time. I mean, you know, two years in the, in the environment I've lived through as a politician uh, is an eternity. I mean, you look at the last 14 years. You know, think of where we were in 2010, 2012, 14, 16, 18, 20. I mean, it's all completely different. Um, and so it's very difficult to set a 10-year uh, uh, trajectory in a world where, you know, over the last 10 years we've had Brexit, we've had a pandemic, we've had uh, war in Ukraine, we've had energy uh, spikes as a consequence of all those things, part of some of those things. And I, I just don't see a world now where you can have a 10-year plan without it changing quite considerably. I mean, if we're in 2024 now, I mean, we have no idea where we'll be in 2024. But I mean, a measure of that uh, instability has been the will of the governing party. I mean, well, uh, in terms of 
changing the leadership yeah, yeah, yeah. in terms of having referendums yeah, and all that. There were dramas it's not the thinking long term, it's look, actually introducing no, 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 no. chaos into look, the look, system. I, I get that, okay, so you can say that, you know, you look at the Tory party, whatever, and it's, and it's various sort of dramatic, um, you know, uh, reinventions. Um, but also you look at the world. I mean, a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about, you know, if it, you know, Putin's invasion of uh, Ukraine, uh, 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 you know, Trump, and we haven't no. even mentioned him, uh, COVID. No, I understand that. These, these are global no, issues. The point I'm, I'm making is that the governing party quite deliberately in the management of its own affairs in the country chose not to have a long-term view. I, to I, change I, think, I think that's slightly not the case because I think in a lot of these instances, the, the governing party and politicians are reacting to events. So, for example, once the Brexit vote happened, you, one had to react to that. You couldn't just pretend that it hadn't happened. Yeah. When, pa when COVID happened, one had to react to that. That wasn't something which uh, anyone designed or wanted to have. Yeah, well, I mean, the Brexit um, referendum wasn't an act of God, was it? No, it was, it was <laughs> I agree, I agree, I agree. Yeah. it wasn't. But, the, but, we, but once, the, well, I mean, for whatever reason, uh, you know, we had, to we, we had to know it could go either way and we had to respond to, 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 to the, the decision. I mean, we just had to do that. I mean, and the way that happened was, you know, ideal. I mean, I think, you know, if I were to write a, a book, as I might do about this situation, the, the critical moment was the 2017, for me, sorry. The critical moment was the 2017. I mean, when we lost that majority in 2017, that put a whole bunch of instability in the system that the, the, we, didn't, we, didn't, we hadn't planned for. And we, didn't, we didn't want to have that. I mean, yeah, we, we, made we when it was the election. election you didn't need to call. I mean, that's my point. It, 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 it's true, it's true. But, but she thought, I mean, it's very easy with hindsight to say it was a complete catastrophe. At the time, she thought that was going to bring more stability because she was going to get a majority. But even within administrations, and back to your point, there's no need to change housing minister every night. No, months, that, I agree with that. I mean, that, that but, but again, a lot of that is to do with the instability. So, you know, I remember when we came back in 2017, I mean, this is all my new shine, but the, the government had to be reshuffled no, but, in mean, order to, to, to keep it stable. But, for example, a priority of this government has been to remove the fixed-term parliament act, which means that we now have a year of political instability. Which no, but, but, but Adam, I mean, the fixed-term parliament... I mean, we're going down into real political weeds. I mean, the fixed-term parliament act was supposed to give stability, but it didn't. We had, we, in, even when it was op in operation, we had short elections. It could have been. In 2017, we had an election. Yeah, in 2018, that, 19, but it, we had an election. It could have and we had the fixed term parliament. And we might have to agree to disagree. So, uh, look, I, mean, the, you know, um, yes. I didn't, mean, I didn't so want this let, to go into... In Camden, George, I was going to come to you there next. is a um, <laughs> massive hole in the middle of Camden, which is no one is working on which is where HS2 is meant to be built. Yeah, okay, yeah. And that is an example of something that has been dragging on for <laughs> over a decade um, with massive instability um, and where we really need long-term decision-making that mm. should be and could be made um, around infrastructure. And so we're the kind of the, the constant under one government going back and forth is, is, has, has, is spooking the private sector yeah, and is meaning we're, we're not building something that has I mean, cost absolutely billions, and there's now like you know not even going to uh, to, to to Manchester. So I think we absolutely do need to look at long-term infrastructure I planning. That. I think if we could actually localize some of that and look at different kind of models to to capture value, we might be much better as a country following models in other European countries at um, investing in infrastructure. <laughs> just on the localization point, would you localize justice services? Just back to the questions. I mean, yes. I think I would. You know, I would move towards that. I can't say it's the first thing on local <coughs> government's uh, list at the moment, but I think that we, the, the, the more that we're bringing into localised place-based systems, I think the, the, the better they will be run. And I think there's areas at the moment where we are double investing, so employment support, where um, you know, we're seeing real failures in the way that job centres support people. In Camden, we invest millions into an alternative system, mm -hmm. which, which there are real savings in, in being able to to, 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 to <coughs> decentralise and devolve funding. I didn't expect to say in this panel that I agreed with Kazi, but I do absolutely uh, agree with you on that. And to the, the question about AI, I mean, there are, I think there are, or, or technology, I think there are real use cases for, for AI and, and technology. One of the real frustrations in trying to bring 
public services together is all on different systems that don't talk to each other. Um, and so it, it, it means that for people, they have to tell their story many different times, um, and they don't have, um, and, and it, it, it's very complex to be able to, to give a unified um, service to them. But I think AI has to enable and support relationships, because actually what transforms people's lives is, is relationships. So I don't see technology as a, as a replacement for the kind of investment in frontline su support, working alongside people, um, whether that's to, to get them into to work or to help them more live more independently, but something that, that can uh, enable and support those front lines. So I, th I think there's an issue on AI where I think actually collectively in this country we're doing quite well looking at the implications of it, but there is a massive issue which is avoided about the nature of privacy and the ownership of data where in many areas, you know, motoring, for example, that's completely violated, whereas in other areas, health, uh, people throw up their hands very often about uh, the sharing of information. And as you well know, you know, AI only works if you've got decent information that you're uh, trawling through and that you can actually legitimately make those connections. And I, I, I don't think, you know, I think that's an issue an immediate issue, a pressing issue, but I don't think it's one where we've found the answers yet. I think something about people understanding it, and we've done, um, we, I really believe in citizens' assemblies as a way to bring people in decision making, and we've done one on the use of data and AI, which was fascinating, getting people from very different lived experiences to actually look at, you know, all the different ways that data is used within the council and more broadly, and how that that should be done and how we explain that to people because it's a whole set of rights that we need to, to, to develop in, in how we share people's data. We need to bring people into that conversation. But, I mean, you don't want the NHS app hallucinating about people's medical conditions. Quasi, right. um, I just wanted to bring a question to you yeah, quickly sure. um, from online from Andrew Pierce, who said... Andrew Pierce. Uh, not, not that not, one, not I don't not. think, no. <laughs> um, I'm surprised. Quasi <laughs> um, says that a 10-year horizon is not feasible. However, areas like infrastructure Structure, prison building, etc., will always be in demand and need a long-term horizon. Can we not have different horizons for different areas? I think you're right. I, 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 my point about the 10 years was that it's very challenging. If you cast our mind back to what's happened in the last 10 years, in 2014, I don't think anyone could have predicted for you know even a tenth of what actually happened. And any plan we had um, would have had to be modified. I mean, look at the COVID. We talk about public spending. I mean, it was COVID that really ramped up public spending. Uh, to a point that nobody had, had ever fore foreseen. So I'm just saying that given the world we're in, it is very, very challenging to have a 10-year plan. That doesn't mean you can't, you, you've got to do everything in a year. Um, I think there is a balance. Um, I also think in terms of long-term planning, I mean, as a constituency MP, the biggest issue, one of the biggest issues I faced when I was elected was the Heathrow debate. And that's a classic thing where we've gone round in circles. The government paper was in 2003, that was 21 years ago, recommending a third runway. And we've literally gone round the houses. And I estimate that even if we started tomorrow building the third runway, the, the, the planes wouldn't take off for another 20 years. So that's 40 years where we've essentially sort of gone round this debate. And, and actually, nothing's going to start tomorrow. So you know, that's a classic example, I think, of some of the challenges that we face in terms of long-term planning and infrastructure. And I just wanted to give that as an example given my own constituency and experience. Can I just say, I think we could have predicted, indeed we did predict, that a massive cuts in prevention through our austerity and local government would leave 14 years later to a crisis in public services. So I think if we, you know, that we do know that if we, if we cut preventative services, then we end up where we are today. And so we could make those um, long-term decisions. Can I just um, ask a question? We've got a couple of questions here um, from online, both making it a similar point. First one says, isn't the biggest problem uh, public expectation of European public services with US taxation? And another one, one of the panellists is advocating increasing local taxation. Tax is al already high. Do you think the public would be prepared to pay even more Thank taxes? George, I'll come to you on that first. Yeah, I mean, I think that I'm advocating the powers and um, decision making to, to be locally, including um, uh, potentially um, uh, the, the, the power to, to create more taxes and to um, like land value taxes that would uh, look at the, um, 
the, the, increased, um, the increases businesses and even homeowners get from investment locally. So I think there are instances where you can see that direct link where people would be uh, potentially willing to accept um, uh, higher taxation. I think that the, you know, the, the conversations we have with our communities, you know, when they see the state of, of public services, particularly the NHS uh, and how stretched people are, I think that there, you know, there, there, there is that um, there, there is that appetite. Um, well, I've forgotten what the first question was. Um, it was about wanting European yeah, levels. Yeah, of the service. expectations. Yeah, I think, I think there's different. There's ways to run our public services differently, which are much more uh, alongside communities and work and working with frontline staff and those who are recipients uh, in much more of a kind of conversation about how we deliver them. And I think there's those those models that have that have come up in place that mean we could. We could we could improve that that delivery within the kind of current funding envelope. Look, so I think the first question actually hits the nail on the head. I mean, that's the fundamental problem. And I'm old enough to remember. I think it was about 20 years ago, and it wasn't Gordon Brown, but it was someone in the in the Labour high up in the Labour government was saying. He, he said, "This is great. We've got European public services and U.S. tax levels." I mean, that was something that I remember the the old Labour government, the old new Labour government, uh, uh, you know, celebrated. But there is a fundamental problem in that. There is, because as you say, expectations uh, grow. I think people have a right to see better services over, you know, we want to see better services over time. And this goes back to the old uh, growth conundrum, because the reason why we, we the, essentially the welfare state grew after the war and, and, and the rest of it was because the economy was, was, could grow and sustain it. And a lot of it was to do with population. Uh, expansion with um, you know higher uh, productivity through education and capital investment and at a time where and every country in the world every advanced economic country in the world faces the same challenge it's very very difficult to keep increasing public spending at a rate faster than your economy and your tax revenues are growing and unless you solve that everything else is, is going to be extremely challenging and Georgia uh, makes the point that where well, there were decisions in 2010 yes that's true but of course you know, the, the spending uh, framework was, was completely blown apart by COVID. I mean, when I was elected in 2010, we were spending 700 billion and we were getting in 540. So there was 160 billion deficit. It was a huge deficit, which we had to deal with. And we did largely over many years. But of course, just as we were tackling that, then COVID came in 2020 and blew a huge hole in public finances. So, the, the, you know, when I was in, in Treasury, we were spending a trillion pounds. And it's more than that compared to 700 billion 10 years before, 11 years before. And, and, and that's going up. And you, you, you try and say, look, you know, as I'm sure many of you in your private lives and even the corporate life, well, maybe we can take 5% out of the spending. Maybe we can take 5% from the trillion, which is 50 billion in savings. Again, very, very difficult politically to do that. So, so all of this resolve, revolves around your ability to raise tax revenue in, and grow the pie, as it were. But the damage was done to public services prior to COVID, and I think it meant we went into COVID with far less resilience than we would otherwise. Yeah, but what was the answer? I mean, in tw I don't want to relitigate the Osborne, you know, world. But, but there was a choice between the balance of taxation and cutting. Spending, there was, wasn't there? but there was also a 160 billion deficit, which was huge at the time. Mm. It was it was enormous. Um, it was something like 12. It was like a wartime deficit, and you know, George Osborne took his view. Um, and we can debate, you know, the, the, it wasn't perfect. I mean, there were, the, there were problems with it. Um, but but again, at the same time, you, you couldn't just keep spending the money as, 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 as when there was a £160 billion deficit. I think we're going to get it tested this year yet again, because, you know, one of, the, one of the paradoxes of reporting is that if you look at opinion polls, people fairly consistently say, yes, we'd be prepared to pay a bit more tax yeah, if yeah. it was for the health yeah. service or education, and yet we know as we're seeing now, that promises of tax cuts uh, are things which politicians think work effectively with voters. So I think the only way that you could really address that first point would be to have, you know, a kind of more uh, in the round public debate about the whole thing and, 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 and be able to say, well, you know, the consequences of tax cuts sure. may promote promised growth in the that's right. In the, in, the, in the middle distance, but in the short term, it actually means that you're not going to get the improvements um, in your public services. But where are we services. seeing growth in the USA where there's been a massive investment? Yeah, but... Yeah, so 
No, you're, I mean, look, as we go through this year, there'll be a huge political debate on this very issue. Yeah. Um, and I think that, but, but a lot of it is, 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 you know, as you go into an election, you're a party leader, or you're trying to hold your, your tribe together, sure. as well as appeal to the middle ground. And I think the view is that, that if, if they do go down the tax cut route, I don't know what but the budget will hold. That's very much about trying to hold the, the, the governing coalition together in a certain way. Um, because you don't need to be a mathematician to see that the government's being squeezed yeah, on both But it sides. is a dilemma in the sense that you, you, you know, you're, you're buying votes or consolidating votes, mm. possibly at the expense of you know, the public infrastructure and the public services. So, but then, but then let, let, me, let me pose the, other, the opposite. There's no way that any government, even a Labour government, <clears throat> would go in and say, well, actually, we're going we're to increase taxes to pay for more of this stuff, when taxes are at a 70-year high. I just don't see that as a, Do you think that, as well, a viable I mean, message. I mean, we heard um, Karen earlier saying we'll have to look at the books when we come into... Yeah, every government does that. Every single government yeah. in history has done that. The type of thing we might um, <laughs> we'll look hear at more about post-election. The, yeah, sure. I mean, that's what <clears throat> the Mario Cuomo thing... It's yeah. most in the sense of, you know, you, you campaign in poetry and govern in prose. But it was, I mean, it was one of the things the new Labour government got, which is they did increase the tax burden at the same time uh, without people squeezing. So the what they it. did was, if you will remember, they, they stuck to conservative spending. Initially. So initially. So the first four years, the, the, the budget, for, it's a r r remarkable yeah. history, actually. And I got yeah. in trouble in Tory conference in 2012 for saying this. It was the most fiscally conservative government in history, 97 to 2001. The, the, the budget was either in surplus or in balance every single year. And, and that ne that's never happened. Um, but then, of course, after that, they, 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 they'd shown their kind of fiscal resilience, or, you know, sort of prowess, as it were, the Iron Chancellor, all of that. Mm. And, then, and then they started spending money. But got okay. up the education and the health service. Yeah, so we, can, we can have one, a... I'm going to take one more round of questions from the audience, because I know there's probably lots of people. I'm going to go uh, to there and then down here, in lady in the middle. Thanks. Leonora Merry from the Nuffield Trust. Um, it seems we're painted into a bit of a corner. We've got uh, both parties' fiscal plans being described as fantasy um, by Hannah White this morning. We've got, um, apparently, we can't talk about long term public services planning, but yet we need to bet the farm on long term growth. So, what does this actually mean for the people who use public services? And is it time to be thinking about the offer? that we give them. So we've recently been talking about the offer for NHS dentistry. Um, we don't even have a two-tier system, we have a three-tier system. Those who've got pri who can afford to go private, those who have an NHS dentist, and those who don't. So is it time to be thinking, actually, there are some public services where we need to refocus on people who actually need them most? Thank you. Uh, and then two questions down here. Chris Smythe from The Times. I mean, Kwasi, when you said that public services are in a, a doom loop, but tax isn't the answer, we need to rely on growth, you sounded a bit like Keir Starmer. Uh, but the, the, the question for him has always been, actually, that's hard. Growth is hard, and it takes a long time. You, know, you, you found there are obstacles to all the things you need to do to get growth. So even if you can do it, and it takes years, what do you do in the meantime? Do we have to put up with years, years more of, you know, essentially rubbish public services? Or do we, you talked about no one wants tax rises. So do, there do we have to do, as Leonora suggested, start telling people there are some things we just can't do, at least not until we, we do get that growth. Thank you. And then next to Thanks. Uh, Emily Roach. I'm a partner at Newton and until recently was a senior civil servant at the Department of Education. Uh, my question is about the devolution agenda. And you've talked about the kind of vulnerability of, of local authorities at the moment. And certainly in my own work, I've seen that kind of variation in, in capability and capacity. What do you think is required in terms of capacity building in local authorities in order to enable them to take on more responsibility for, for public services? Thank you. So um, three really good questions there. So do we need to be uh, refocusing public services on those who need them the most? Uh, what do we do while we're waiting for growth? Uh, and how can we build capacity of local government? Uh, Adam, I might come to you first. I think that public services are already massively focused on the people mm. who need them most in the sense that uh, the, the whole cycle of uh, the consequences of social deprivation and how that can feed into the demands of other public services. Um, whether, you know, when we're talking about, uh, you know, integration, having plans, whether 
we could better focus them in a more constructive way. So, for example, uh, one of the issues within the prison service uh, is not having a population of prison officers which reflects, in terms of diversity, the population of the people in prisons. But, um, as I know from people who've worked in the Ministry of Justice, the problem is, is that the plan on where you cite prisons is precisely not where those diverse populations live, so that you can't therefore recruit uh, a, mixed, a mixed workforce. And I think there is room for thinking through that more flexibility, but it probably in the end comes down to more devolution, which is what we've been talking about. In, is actually, and you know, to a certain extent, the, the experiment with London mayors uh, and with police commissioners is, is trying to move in that direction. Georgia. Yeah, I think it's, there's, there's a kind of question mark about how you achieve growth. You know, there's one model which is um, tax cuts will kind of generate growth or there's a kind of investment-led approach. And I think from, from where I sit, there is, you know, there is a huge amount of private sector money that can be bought in yeah. by better public sector investment. So take an example of uh, decarbonising our buildings. It's some, you know, a huge thing we need to do for net zero, a huge thing we need to do to address fuel poverty. But there's... Uh, many kind of pension funds and um, uh, and other banks who are desperate to invest these trillions they talk about into real projects, but we don't have yet the yeah. capacity to bring those those projects forward, and we haven't yet kind of balanced risk. So we've been working um, with uh, I chair London councils with the the big co uh, cities outside of London to look at kind of new models that would allow us to decarbonise our cities, <laughs> working with the private sector. We just need a bit of government investment that we could leverage in billions to achieve that. So I think there's something about smart investment that, that leverages in uh, new funding and, again, um, uh, invest in local places to, to lead that. Um, and so, the, you know, we've got a pipeline of over a thousand projects, but um, not the capacity to do those deals with the private sector and to bring those those forward. Uh, so so a, a, a small investment could, could do a huge amount. Uh, I do, I mean, the, the capacity of local government has been really stripped out over the, the last uh, 14 years. And I think you, you see particularly the investment in those more preventative services are the first to go because you have statutory responsibilities around adults and, and children's services. And many councils are only able to kind of deal with a crisis point and not the, the prevention. So I'd, I'd like to see you know, a, a, a kind of credible prevention a, a investment to support local government. And also um, investment in, in that transformation capacity. You know, if you are going to bring together the different public <coughs> services in a, in a place to work differently with people, there's huge savings to be achieved there, but you need some capacity to, to transform. Just very quickly, I mean, I think it's very easy to forget you know, when we have a sort of vaguely kind of technocratic debate that actually there are people, it's all about people, it's all about um, the front line. And everyone, you know, who's an MP is very conscious of that. I mean, I had a surgery last week and I was talking to people uh, who were directly affected by the fact that their, their children, you know, have special needs and that there's, there's a shortage of special needs pr provision in education locally. So I, I want to stress the fact that even though it sounds like a technocratic debate, it's always focused. And I think Adam is right. I think people in the system are always focused on the outcome for people. I think that's, I just wanted to make that point. Um, I am Keir Starmer, apparently. Um, <laughs> well, look, I, I, I mean, it, one can be flippant about this, but I think it's a general problem that mo most people are coming to realize this growth issue. Um, and I think, you know, obviously we approach things differently. Um, I mean, I'm not, um, as people think, a Reaganite. I, 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 I've never thought that uh, tax cuts pay for themselves. I think you've got to show some demonstration on spending, and that was one of the things that we, were, we, we discussed uh, in, when I was in government. Um, and we were going to have a, a spending uh, statement. Um, but you've got, to, you've, got to, you've got to match the two. But in terms of how things can turn around, I think things can happen more quickly than you think. I think with the right policies, you can change things around in a kind of nine to 18 month period, as opposed uh, to the, the, the five year period. And I think the time to do that would be if a new government comes in with a mandate. That's when I think a lot of this stuff uh, can happen quickly. And then finally, on devolution and capacity, I think, again, that's a very long-term issue because you've got training, you've got all sorts of things. Uh, capital investment, you've got AI, we haven't mentioned that. There are whole ways in which 
and with a bit of long-term planning, the, the whole outlook of local government in 10 years' time will be completely different, will be completely, could be completely different uh, to what it is today. And I think that, uh, to me, that's a quite an exciting uh, but also challenging opportunity. I think the next generation of politicians, next government, whatever you want to call it, will be looking at how to use actual local provision in a much, much smarter way, largely driven by technology, I would suggest. George, I want to put a question to you from, uh, that we have from Sam Dowling online, which is, how do you think we can manage the handing off of activities between different public service bodies, citing lack of money, resources? How can public services be truly transformed into a collaborative network of accountable bodies? Yeah, I think that is an absolutely great question, because I, I said at the beginning, and you talked about people, and you know, I have uh, residents who you know, uh, are dealing, it's like a full-time job, dealing with all of the different professionals in their life. You know, somebody who, who uh, might be at risk of domestic abuse, has a disabled child, uh, is dealing with employment support, housing, different parts of the NHS. And um, you know, they're, they're, they're telling that story so many different times, different appointments, um, and all they want is just one consistent relationship that sees them as a whole person. Um, and we are not configured yet to do that. But I think that there are models that are achieving this. And in Manchester, they've been working uh, for a long time to bring together health and social care. And they have joint teams that work in neighborhoods, co-located. Um, not yet uh, the same kind of uh, digital systems. They're, they're still looking over each other's shoulders, but they're co-located and, and, and working kind of uh, that team around uh, a person. And what to achieve that, I think we need, um, you need to kind of take the financial decisions out of that front line and, and actually you know, um, co bring budgets together and share the and share um, the kind of prevention savings. So I mentioned Camden's, uh, at the moment, funding, kind of double funding employment services in a much more relational and supportive way. The outcomes are really strong, but local government doesn't get any of the savings from that. That, that goes um, to the centre to, um, uh, to do DWP, and we do it because it's the right thing to do. But if there was, um, if together, the, you know, if we save money and, and prevent things getting worse, that money goes back into the system, then you start to see a really virtuous uh, circle of, of transformation. And I think if you, if you had a duty to cooperate on uh, local services, you know, that in itself would, would make a, a big difference. But then moving on from that, you know, you're looking at co-location, joint teams, and, um, uh, and, and joint funding. Thank you. On that um, uplifting note, uh, I'm going to bring this uh, discussion to an end. Um, We've discussed a lot today about uh, prevention and also uh, capital spending. So I should note that the Institute has work on both of those issues coming out uh, in a few months time. So keep an eye out for that. Um, thank you very much to our three panelists for I think what we could definitely describe as a robust exchange uh, of views uh, today. Uh, thank you to Stuart for his presentation, uh, to Grant Thornton uh, for their support today, and to everyone who has watched and submitted questions. A video and sound recording of the event will be available on the IFG website shortly. Uh, and next up today at 11.50 will be John Glenn, MP, Paymaster General and Minister for the Cabinet Office. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you.